The following program is a presentation of Wyoming Public Television. This program was made possible by a grant from the Ford Foundation. In the center of Wyoming, a vast area covering over two million acres of rolling hills, prairie lands, and mountain ranges is home to 8,000 members of the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes. The two tribes have lived on the Wind River Reservation for over a hundred years. They are governed by two elected tribal business councils, Shoshone and Arapaho, who work together and with the guidance of their elders, make decisions that are shaping the future of the reservation, and in particular, the future of their children. Over the years, as the tribes changed from a nomadic culture with a strong extended family to being farmers and ranchers living in isolated log houses scattered over the reservation, it became difficult to maintain the traditional ways of the Shoshone and the Arapaho. As values changed, problems grew, and the strength of the family structure was weakened. Those most affected were the children. The need to really look at the problems facing families in Rune River became critical in the fall of 1985. Before the epidemic was over, six more young men had committed suicide. After the series of suicides in 1985, the community became really concerned about the problem. You know, when you lose 13 or 14 young people, that's pretty distressing and, and really traumatizes a community. And so there were a series of community meetings. As the community searched for solutions for its children, a complex picture of interrelated problems began to emerge. One primary concern was the lack of self-esteem among young people. When children get into school and all of their teachers are non-Indians, and the, only the aides are, are Indian people, and I mean that makes a statement to those children about their capabilities. And I think that it's really important for their teachers to be Indian people as well. The second secondary reason I think is the fact that um, on our reservation, um, Poverty is at an all-time high. A lot of stress is placed on the family when there isn't enough money to buy the groceries, when there isn't enough money to pay the bills. And when the breadwinner of the family does not have a job, they're frustrated because they can't care for their dependents. And it makes them feel bad. The problems that children experience or have are only a reflection of, of some bigger problem that society has. And our biggest problem, I guess everyone says it over and over, is alcohol. And in the court system here, we're dealing, we're dealing with uh, the results of, of alcohol rather than alcohol itself. One of the ways alcohol abuse affects children is seen in the large number of child custody cases processed in the tribal court. A children's code which regulates these cases and protects the interests of the children is included in the tribal law and order code. But resources to provide social services for these children are limited. To address the problems of the children, we find that uh, we can only answer the most severe cases of neglect abuse and custody, but to work in the area of prevention, to work into the area of awareness and exposure of what our children need, um, we just don't have the resources. The need to come up with creative prevention and intervention strategies is in part a response to the difficulties of being parents in an ever-changing society. We're finding that our parents are younger and younger. Teenagers often um, are the parents of, of small children, and they themselves don't have the experience or the, um, the, the kind of parenting skills that would be helpful. 
I think that the suicide rate, the divorce rate, the crime rate, the alcoholism rate in any given community, not just here on the Wind River Reservation, attest to the lack of parenting skills in this country. One of the biggest responsibilities we have is being parents, and yet there's no, no training for it. You, you become a parent by, you know, just being a parent, and, and, and it's a lifetime responsibility. From what I've experienced, a lot of the children now, uh, they don't have the attention from the parents, you know. I think that we do need more parenting skills. Yeah, I think it's harder to be a parent now because it's really, um, really expensive, even down to clothes, clothing. You, know, you have to work, otherwise you just no, don't get nowhere. And you know, you want, I don't know, you'd want something better for your kid. And so it's just harder. Things were simple a long time ago. Traditionally, children were cared for by the extended family and were taught the ways of the tribe by their elders. But as time passed, educational policies were introduced that disrupted the continuity of traditional child rearing. At the same time as a reservation system was created, so was the Indian boarding schools around the country. And, and the children were physically removed from, from their parents and taken away from the reservation. Their hair was cut. They were given different kind of clothes. While they were there, they could not communicate back home. They could not speak the language while they were in this boarding school. Because of these policies, a whole generation was cut off from their families and their culture. Lacking role models, these children were unprepared to teach their children the traditional ways. There was a real big push, not only from within, but from outside forces that wanted to assimilate us, that wanted us to be like the white man. And I think for a while there, we were kind of in the doldrums, you might say. We didn't, we thought we were gonna go the white man way and then for reasons that I think are within us and within our elders, we started coming back the other way. Now, I think the shift is coming back where we see ourselves more as Indian people. We see ourselves as Shoshones or Arapahos or Crows or Cheyennes. Before we see ourselves as even Americans or United States citizens, and I think that's healthy. Friends and relatives, I proudly present the class of 1989. High school is a good place to learn positive self-concepts, but more and more educators believe that for many students, high school may be too late. Those high school students are really um, who they're going to be in terms of their, pretty much their lives. They, um, they've gone through those formative years, you know, those first five to seven years of their lives, and, and there's a pattern that's already been set. When they get into the, the you know, high school years, it's almost too late in a way because of the kinds of um, environments they've been in and the kinds of experiences they've had as preschool children. The impact of early education on um, accomplishments for children later in life, the, the, the research just supports it all the way down the line. There's been like um, the 20 year Perry Preschool Project that, where they followed those children that went into the Perry Preschool Project um, and High School Research Foundation did that um, study. They followed these children until they were 20 years old and it really did indicate that um, they were um, reaching, you know, um, higher kinds of expectations and um, setting goals and achieving those goals. Um, when compared to other children who hadn't received that kind of early childhood experience. Well, Child Development Services is a nonprofit um, developmental preschool that um, is funded through the state of Wyoming to provide special education and other related therapies to um, special needs preschool children in Fremont County, um, children that have any kind of developmental delays in whatever area, either language or cognitive or fine motor or gross motor, so that we can um, provide the kind of early intervention that would hopefully help catch them up to speed before they go into school. 
Now the program that exists on the reservation, that's, um, it's a Title VII, um, it's called the Parent, Parent and Child English Project, PACE Project, and it's um, sponsored by Child Development Services. In other words, we got the funding, the Title VII funding from the U.S. Department of Education through Child Development Services to serve reservation children. She does use her sign a lot more since she started school, and she's real. She's really anxious to come here to school and to come to school, and she, she really um, it excites her to come to school. And when she comes home from school, she always tells us, you know, with her with her hands what she did at school or if she had fun or you know. So it's really exciting for us to see her attend this place. But there are many more eligible children on the reservation who aren't able to participate in a preschool program. I wanted him to go to Head Start, but apparently they said that they didn't have room for him and that my application was late. They kind of heard him because, you know, he, every time the Head Start bus would come through here in the morning, he'd feel bad. He said, they don't want me at the school, but I told him it's not that. They just didn't have any room for him. So, you know, when I look around, not just only him, there's a lot of children that, you know, seem like, you know, they can't get into school or either that, you know, their income is too high. You know, they're, they're too high to get into Head Start. Their families, they say they make too much money and then sometimes they get left out like he does. Head Start is a federally funded preschool program that operates nationwide, providing services to low-income families. It is a comprehensive program that includes education, social services, health, nutrition, and parent involvement. There are three centers on the reservation, at Fort Washakie, Arapaho, and Ethity. It's my understanding Head Start is now 21 years old on this reservation and is still, to this date, the only comprehensive child care provider for young children. I think now more and more people are getting hip to the idea. They're saying, gee, we need alternatives here. I don't take it that Head Start isn't doing its effective job. It's just that there are more needs than Head Start can realistically accommodate. I do know that we have extensive waiting lists. You know, We have 38 people from each center, families and children in each community who are on waiting lists. So the need is there. They, uh, but we can't accommodate them all. We're only funded for 125. I think the most valuable thing about Head Start is these, these little kids that are coming in here, you know, leaving their home just for the first time away from their mother and their parents, and they're afraid. So we have to earn their trust, and they have to be able to trust us. And sometimes it's kind of hard, but they come around. And I think it's so important. I, I hope our job's important. I think it is. Because you really, you, you just have to teach them a lot. That may, basically, maybe they've never learned at home yet. And I'm hoping that we're teaching them what they need to know. Because Head Start is defined as comprehensive young children and family services, it is very complex. There are many, many different aspects to the whole program. I think that it could be done in a simpler, simplified manner. It is not just a babysitting service. It is not just a daycare service. But that is not to say that those services aren't needed. Why couldn't some independents establish daycare, establish some uh, after-school, preschool situations? The only licensed daycare center providing preschool and after-school care that we could find was in the home of Leela Trehearn who has been taking care of children on the reservation for 25 years. I'm licensed for six. They come out and, and give me my rules and regulations, and, and I'm certified by the state in foster care and daycare. I've just, ever since I can remember, I've always worked with kids, you know. Tried to quit several times, and they keep coming back because they can't find one that's regular you know, that's there every day. And I think that's important and watch them so they don't get hurt, I guess. But you, you gotta be here and you're, you're really tied down, you know, 
babysitting. I'm going to retire in a couple weeks. <laughs> it's been a, a real interesting life. When Leela Treherne retires, the parents yeah. of the children she cares for will have a problem finding an alternative. Yeah, that's upside down. I see that goes like that. There's a definite need from, um, well, from my, my situation and um, uh, quite a few friends I have that are single parents and they, who are working and they're, they do have a need for a place to leave, uh, leave their kids. As of now, there's no, um, uh, not any other service available. For working parents, availability is not the only issue. Cost is another consideration. Like most of the time when you work, it seems like all your check goes to babysitting, so you I wonder if it's really worth working. Just when you want to get off all the programs and then you're back to broke again. A lot of people want to go to school or work, but you know, they, they don't have anybody to watch their kids. And it would have to be a reasonable price because they don't have just one kid, they have lots of kids. 15, 15, five, let's see, nine, nine boys and six girls. In the spring of 1989, having relied on family members to help care for her children, Karen Brown realized a lifelong dream and graduated from Central Wyoming College with a degree in nursing. I don't know what I would have done. I don't. I, I don't. I know I couldn't have went to school if I had to use daycare. You know, if I would have had to put my kids in a daycare because there isn't any here. Like my oldest daughter now has a year, has a baby that's a year old, and. While I was going to school, it was hard for her to go to work because she didn't have a babysitter. And there's no place to leave the babies. The main consideration here is people need adequate daycare facilities and programs to enable them to uh, pursue uh, careers, jobs, or whatever, because of the unemployment rate here, which is approximately 70%. Uh, rather than have social services, you need support services to enable people to acquire employment and to continue their employment. Um, and I, this, this is my own personal view. Um, the only way that the tribe can really succeed our progress will have to be in a private sector. And uh, child care will be one, one part of, of the complete picture. With the opening of a new sewing factory, the Arapaho tribe has helped to create employment, but the problem of reliable, affordable childcare for the workers remains critical. We've lost uh, three good operators because of, of no sitter. I do know that, we, that our employees do rely a great deal on family members to help, but then things happen. I have one girl here that, uh, that I hope you get an opportunity to talk with today, that she's going to send her children out of the state for the summer because she can't afford to, to work here, I mean, and pay a sitter or a daycare center. We don't pay that kind of wages that, that can compensate. We hire in to train for 60 days at $3.50 an hour, and we have a, a kind of a probationary period of 60 days. And at the end of that time, we adjust the wages according to attendance. I was paying a dollar an hour for him and his youngest brother, but he is a real happy person, child. But um, I don't know. I had to get people I don't even know <laughs> to babysit. I figured, well, I figure out if I had to pay him, if I had to take him to daycare nine hours a day for, for three children, I wouldn't know how I would survive. <laughs> I've heard that they, they are gonna give, you know, the working parent what they put into daycare after they file their taxes. But still, you gotta struggle all year just to do that, especially if you're one parent household, so. 
I'd rather be working anyway. It's part of, part of everyday living. <laughs> We've talked about a daycare center here at the location. And unfortunately, we haven't done anything in that area yet. In a needs assessment recently conducted by the tribes, heads of household were asked to identify the issues of paramount concern to families on the reservation. A lot of the answers that we got asked that the tribe provide some type of daycare service for the working heads of household, whether it be the working mother or both parents working or a single working parent. And that seemed to be a pretty common uh, answer to the survey, which, had a, which the survey had itself had a response rate of 96 percent. As a first step toward providing daycare on the reservation, the tribes have added a section to the Children's Code which will regulate the operation of child care facilities. Any kind of uh, business that's watching children or, or caring for children would have to be certified in order to meet, you know, the requirements that, for instance, uh, the requirements are the, that are uh, put into this, uh, the certification uh, procedures are pretty much follow the state requirements. You know, there's the space, the, the cleanliness of the place, and, and just to make sure that when a child is placed there that uh, that facility, you know, is a good, proper facility. With funds committed by the Shoshone Business Council, ground has been broken for a new facility for Head Start in the Fort Washakie area. According to Karen King, director of Head Start, the space is more than adequate for their needs. We're hoping to um, eventually tie in with some of the other agencies who are, who are looking for daycare. Currently, we have no Head Start expansion funds. We cannot expand to meet the facilities that we had hoped to. Therefore, we have to coordinate with other people who are trying to start up private daycare providing, uh, as well as other federal agencies providing. Also, the tribes might start something themselves in terms of daycare. I think it's very important that the Joint Business Council be that catalyst to develop that initiative, to develop programs, and to coordinate the activities of other entities on this reservation who are involved in education, who are involved with uh, uh, training, who are involved with uh, social kinds of programs. Uh, get the reservation and the schools and everybody concerned with education working together, coordinating activities. And I think we should get to the point where we might even tailor individual programs for each one of our children on this reservation. Listen to the rattle of the recall sound. Faster, faster, than it is. In order for the Joint Business Council to develop and coordinate programs for young children, they first need adequate funding. In order to facilitate quality programs with quality staff and um, equipment and materials, and it's expensive. And those of us who are working in the project and on the reservation really do feel that it needs to be sort of a tribal kind of um, commitment that needs to be made, and then. Uh, once that happens, um, uh, seek as a, a tribe the funding that will uh, create the kinds of programs that we feel are quality programs that, to foster the kinds of development that we'd like to see happen for children. And they're beginning to support those kinds of moves. There are people out here in the communities that have um, the expertise and that also have the, the drive and the vision for the kinds of things that need to happen. Training community members as teachers for these preschool programs is one way to help children develop a strong sense of identity. At this point in time, it's important for us to provide that Indian role model for our children. They need, they need to see us working too. They need to see us in action, doing the things that are necessary. They need to see us taking care of them. Involving parents and families in the programs is also critical to their success. That's what we need to do is um, serve families, communities. Start with the child and their parent where they are and take them as far as we can, you know, to their optimum level of functioning. It makes the children feel better, too, about themselves 
when their parents come in and help. And in a way, it shows them they care. Feeling good about themselves when they are young can also help children avoid the problems of drug and alcohol abuse as they grow up. And the younger they are, I think the more success we're going to have if we start teaching them and when they're younger so they'll have like 12 years of, of learning all that and being able to say no. What are some ways you can be safe? Letting children learn at their own pace and initiate their own activities are key factors in early childhood education. How are they going to learn to function if they're not given the experiences? And if we don't learn by doing, then we don't learn. If somebody tells us things over and over, it doesn't sink in. But if we do it for ourselves and we find out whether it works or it doesn't work and how we may do it differently the next time, that's how we learn. Finally, parents and educators both believe that preschool is the best age to introduce children to culturally relevant learning. Including grandparents in programs for young children is an important way of connecting children to the traditional ways of the tribes. That kind of exposure for children is really important. And having pictures of them, having pictures of their family, pictures of their community, I think that that's, um, you know, that's where you start in terms of providing cultural relevance, to start with them, their culture. And these children know who they are as Indian children. They're our future. They're there, that's what's gonna make it happen. Our children are gonna be able to carry that on and to be able to strengthen that vision. But they have to maintain, you know, their, their strong, our strong ties with our elders and our traditional ways while getting heavily involved in the modern ways that we have to, of education, training. We have to get our children in that frame of mind and our children are, are the main force that are gonna guide that. In the next decade or two, the present newborn generation is gonna be bringing in another generation. And we have to make sure that they have the positive attitudes, they have the direction to be able to bring that new generation in with an even stronger driving force and stronger motivation to keep that going. And we can be an example for not only ourselves and our future, but for other tribes, for other states, for other countries throughout this world. This program was made possible by a grant from the Ford Foundation.